go into the world and tell every man that you meet there is a man on the cross a catholic take what you need to know right now a bold synthesis of inspiration and information keeping you up to date on the news and issues from a courageous catholic perspective a Catholic Take with Joe McLean starts now. Praise be to Jesus Christ. Welcome back to A Catholic Take, a bold synthesis of information and inspiration. I'm your host, Joe McLean, and it is good to be on with you. Tucker Carlson, Vladimir Putin, and Dante's Inferno. To hell and back we go today. It's going to be a great journey, and I hope you're going to be along for the entire ride. Do share us with a friend if you can. But our good friend Mike Koeniger, the brick wall, friend of the show, is going to be on the show at uh, 14 past Let's talk about that Tucker Carlson interview. I'd love to know what you think about it. Did you watch it? I mean, tens of millions of people watched it very quickly once it released. I watched the whole thing, watched parts of it a few times. I have my opinions. I'd love to get yours. In fact, producer Jake, why don't we put up a poll? What did you think of the Tucker Carlson Vladimir Putin interview today? Liked it? Loved it? Hated it? Not sure? I don't know, but let's find out. Eric, our music is going to be on the program at 30 past the hour. We're going to go on a ride through the pits of hell with Eric Armusic's art, his Dante Inferno art series. In fact, the guy is an incredible artist. His work is wonderful. And we're going to be talking about how his Catholic faith influences his art, how he helps other people with their art. And we're going to look at his series on Dante's Inferno. All of that on the program today and much, much more. We'll link to the show notes, of course, over at thestationofthecross.com forward slash a his work C is D. wonderful. Do and we're going to be talking about if you can. how his Catholic faith influences his art. Let's pray. Let's begin. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Remember, O most gracious Virgin Mary, that never was it known that anyone who fled to thy protection, implored thy help, or sought thine intercession was left unaided. Inspired by this confidence, I fly unto thee, O Virgin of virgins, my mother. To thee do I come, before thee I stand, sinful and sorrowful. O mother of the word incarnate, despise not my petitions, but in thy mercy hear and answer me. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And now your saint of the day. Saint Cyril of Alexandria, pray for us. Cyril was born in Egypt around the year 376 and was educated by his maternal uncle, Theophilus, the patriarch of Alexandria who had fallen out of favor with Rome due to his part in deposing St. John Chrysostom. In 412, Cyril succeeded his late uncle as patriarch and immediately suppressed the Novatian heretics in Alexandria. Cyril was plagued by an unruly populace and a power struggle with the Egypt Egyptian prefect, Orestes, but he did succeed in firmly reestablishing communion with Rome after his uncle's mistakes. Cyril would appeal directly to Rome after a debate with Nestorius, the heretical bishop of Constantinople. Pope St. Celestine I supported Cyril, who zealously led the Council of Ephesus that condemned the Nestorian heresy, confirmed that Jesus Christ was one person with two natures, human and divine, and proclaimed Mary's title of Theotokos. The decrees of the Council were confirmed by Celestine's successor, Pope St. Sixtus III. Cyril died in the year of our Lord 444, having completed many great theological works. Some writings were sadly misinterpreted and used by the Monophysite heretics. But nonetheless, Cyril was venerated highly in the East and finally added to the general Roman calendar as a doctor of the church by Pope Leo XIII. His feast in the modern calendar is June 27th. For more about this day and others in the church's calendar, visit thestationofthecross.com slash saints and seasons. St. Cyril of Alexandria, pray for us. And now your headline news. Breitbart reports Ukraine sacks head of armed forces. General Valery Zalushny has been removed as the head of the Ukrainian Armed Forces. A detailed breakdown of improvements needed by his successor was laid out by President Zelensky. Morale is low in Ukraine and citizens talk of victory less often, he says, while calling for serious change in method and tempo. President Zelensky revealed that Colonel General Alexander Sierski, the leader of the Ukraine's land forces, has been appointed to replace General Zalushny. The Hill reports, speaking of Ukraine, that the uh, Senate is advancing a Ukraine funding without border security reforms. The Senate voted yesterday to advance a $95 billion emergency security spending bill with 
$60 billion to support the war in Ukraine. The votes were 67 to 32 to advance a legislative vehicle that Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer says will be used to carry funding for Ukraine, Israel, Indo-Pacific security and humanitarian assistance for civilians around the world. The Senate still needs to hold at least five more votes to pass the funding for Ukraine and Israel to send it to the House where it faces a rocky road. Just notice that they did an emergency funding thing for Ukraine and nothing for the border. Let that sink in. LifeSite News is reporting warnings of mass starvation in Gaza as Western powers freeze U.N. relief funds. Following Israeli reports of Hamas infiltration to the aid of the United Nations Relief and Welfare Agency was suspended in a move which some claim to lead to mass starvation. British journalist Lindsay Hilsom gained access to the Israeli dossier, which has not been received by the U.N. Quoting directly from the dossier, she stated, quote, that the Hamas terrorist organization has been methodically and deliberately emplacing its terrorist infrastructure in a wide range of U.N. facilities and assets. But Hilsom continues, quote, But it provides no evidence to support its explosive new claim that U.N. staff were involved in the terror attacks on Israel back in October, close quote. Meanwhile, the UNRWA reports that 130 of its workers had been killed in Gaza as a result of the massive Israeli attacks on the region. And those, those are your headline news. The gospel today comes to us from Mark chapter 7, verses 31 through 37. Jesus left the district of Tyre and went by way of Sidon to the Sea of Galilee into the district of the Decapolis. And people brought to him a deaf man who had a speech impediment and begged him to lay his hand on him. He took him off by himself away from the crowd He put his finger into the man's ears and, spitting, touched his tongue. Then he looked up to heaven and groaned and said to him, Ephatha, that is, be opened. And immediately the man's ears were opened, his speech impediment was removed, and he spoke plainly. He ordered them not to tell anyone, but the more he ordered them not to, the more they proclaimed it. They were exceedingly astonished, and they said, He has done all things well, and he makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Cornelius Alapide had a lot to say today. He says, Christ wrought harmoniously, as though by his healing saliva, he would moisten and loosen the dumb mouth, which was bound through drought. Now he spat not upon the mouth of the mute, but upon his own finger, and by means of his finger applied the saliva to the mouth of the mute, as may be gathered from the Greek. This was required by propriety and decorum. Moreover, when Christ opened the ears and unclosed the tongue of the body, he opened also the ears and tongue of the soul, that they might listen to his inspiration and believe that he was the Messiah and that they might ask and obtain of him pardon of their sins. I, I actually love these types of passages because generally he doesn't have to, like, like the woman whose daughter was possessed, go, your faith has saved you, right? This, the, uh, you know, the, uh, the ruler whose servant or his son was, was inflicted, go, your faith has saved you. I mean, the ruler didn't even show up. He just sent word, right? Like that the, the Roman centurion just sends word, like sends a servant to speak on his behalf. Like, think about that. And But here in these cases, like the Lord touches, like he touches the leper. He uses saliva and his finger touching. I mean, I think that extra, extra element or that detail, I think it's just absolutely fascinating. Tropologically speaking, Cornelius Lapidate goes on to say, Everyone ought to seek the same thing and say with the psalmist, O Lord, open thou my lips and my mouth shall show forth thy praise. Psalm 51, 17. We ought to do the same as regards our ears that we may be able to sing aloud with Isaiah 1, 4. The Lord God hath given me the tongue of the learned that I should know how to speak a word in season to him that is weary. He weakeneth morning by morning. He wakeneth my, my ear to hear as the learned. 
Now is now this is done when he himself with his own finger, that is the Holy Ghost, for he is the finger of God, Exodus eight nineteen, and the spittle of heavenly wisdom, which is he himself proceeding forth from the mouth of the Most High, touches the tongue of the soul. Cornelius Lapide would go on to say he groaned both because he sympathized with the misery of the death, the deaf and dumb man, as because in groaning he prayed and obtained healing from him for God or healing for him from God. He charged them that they should tell no man. That is, this was not properly a command involving a fault if disobeyed, but merely a token of urbanity and modesty, that indeed he might signify he would not make a parade of his miracles or by their means obtain the vainglory of men. He did not come to be, you know, Nero and pass out bread at the amphitheater and just say, hey, look at me. How, how amazing am I, right? That is not why he has come. He has come to lead you to, to God the Father, God the Holy Ghost, to his blessed mother, to the saints, to the family of God, to salvation itself. He has come to open the way to salvation through grace. He has come to give you an opportunity to repent, to confess, to be transformed, to put away the old self and put on the new, to enter into the baptismal waters and come out resurrected. But he's asking you, more importantly, to cooperate with those graces. He's doing all the heavy lifting, but you have to say yes, and you have to cooperate. And then you have to live the rest of your life as though you have said yes, and that yes has a meaning in your life. You can't just continue to be the old person. It's time to die to self. Be right back. Don't go anywhere. Jesus Christ, welcome back to A Catholic Take, a bold synthesis of information and inspiration. I'm your host, Joe McLean. It is great to be on with you today. Praise be to God. Coming up at 30 past the hour, we're going to go to hell and back. We're going to be talking about Dante's Inferno series. This is an art series that's lasted now over the last several years with artist Eric R. Music, and we're going to have a conversation about his art, his Catholic faith, how that inspires him, and specifically about Dante's Inferno. It uh, looks like incredible art, so I'm looking forward to having this conversation. Do join us if you can. But uh, there are lots of stories in the news, of course, that are of great concern to me. We're going to be linking to these stories for you over in the show notes at thestationofthecross.com forward slash A-C-T. Like, did you hear? Rep Anna Paulina Luna? She was uh, promo- uh, putting a forth a bill to say that if they're going to force Americans to fight in Ukraine, then congressmen have to go fight, too. Could you imagine congressmen fighting on the front lines? Wouldn't that be interesting? Davy Crockett might be the last one to have done so. I can't remember. Uh, anyway, uh, we're going to link to everything over at the station of the cross dot com forward slash ACT. Get the show notes there. Join the email list there. Get in on the inside. We give you access to the Telegram group. We give you a full lineup of talks just to say thank you for joining the team. And we send you goodies in your email inbox every single week, or at least that's the goal. Sometimes it's every few weeks. But nonetheless, you're going to get access to the back end. Go to the stationofthecross.com forward slash ACT. Did you catch the big interview from Tucker Carlson and Vladimir Putin? Right now there's a poll up on our YouTube stream. What did you think of the of the Tucker Carlson Vladimir Putin interview? 38% say they loved it, 0% say they, said they hated it, 38% said it was interesting, and 25% said it was not sure. I'd love to get your take. Be sure to vote today. But let's go to Mike Koeniger, friend of the show, Brick Wall over in Virginia. Good morning to you, Mike. What would you think? Tucker Carlson, Vladimir Putin, what was your opinion? Oh, good morning, Joe. It, it was a I, – I, I'm in the interesting camp. I, I think it was quite interesting. Um I, I know those former history students of the year, like you and myself, both uh, probably enjoyed the first 30 minute history lesson he gave us, uh, <laughs> which, you know, I, I had watched Tucker's little preview and he said he goes on and on. But I guess he had a point. I, I, I didn't find that uh, his his history from 865 to uh, 1930 was terribly compelling, by the way. Uh, all land is conquered land. All land belonged to somebody else before. I thought that whole argument was specious, but uh, once he started talking about 2014 and on 
and uh, 1989 and on, I, I thought he had some interesting arguments. Uh, but Joe, before I, I even comment much more, we have to understand this is a former intelligence officer. He right. knows yeah. he knows the game of propaganda. He knows how to look good. He's very yeah. polished. He's obviously incredibly bright. And so he knows how to deliver his message. And, I loved it, uh, yeah. I loved it yeah. from that perspective. For me, that was the <laughs> entertainment part, right? Like uh, Vladimir Putin is no is no dumb. He's been around the block for a long time. And, of course, you know, he's, he's, a, he's a heavy hitter when it comes to, like, uh, propaganda and, uh, of course, uh, you know, manipulation and speech. And, and just take up the first 30 minutes plus in a history lesson that sort of meanders. And to your point, I agree. I mean, everything – the entire history of humanity is a, is a history and in, in, of moving borders of of immigration. That's that's true for all of humanity. There's no exception to the rule. So, like, where are we going with this? And Tucker, it seemed like Tucker couldn't really he couldn't get a word in edgewise. Every time he tried, Vladimir Putin put him back in his place, and I thought that was kind of interesting. He did he did ask some very interesting questions. Nonetheless, we finally got to some of them, like uh, who bombed the pipe a pipeline. I thought that was an interesting moment, didn't you? Oh, I, I was fascinated by that, and, and quite frankly, the only uh, side that had anything to gain in that was Ukraine to bomb that pipeline. So so there's certainly something going there. I, I think his point regarding the coup in Ukraine in 2014, uh, I think that's kind of common knowledge amongst those news junkies around that the CIA likely had a hand in it, just like they did in the 28-day Mordad coup in Iran in 19, what was that, 57. So... Um, you know, I don't think those are big shockers. Uh, you know, we, we know the CIA plays games and, and, and it's certainly usually in the American interest to do so. Uh, I, I still haven't figured out why the pipeline was particularly in anyone's interest except Ukraine. Uh, so I, I thought that interesting. Um, you know, the bottom line, Joe, is if Colonel Dooley's estimates are correct, Russia's lost 300,000 people fighting this war. And, and I'm still not sure what the gain is other than the Donbass region. And uh, that's what I struggle with. Well, if we're following Vladimir Putin's argumentation, he's saying, listen, Ukraine is historically a part of Russia, so it needs to continue to be historically part of Russia. We talked about that a minute ago. Well, that's kind of, uh, you know, like you say, a specious argument. I mean, is that's the same argument that uh, Palestinians use to say that Israel doesn't belong to, to the Jews, for instance. Or you could argue that Texas doesn't belong to America, should belong to Mexico, for instance. You can make that argument. So there's that. But then on the other side of that is, okay, well, at the end of the day, there is a contentious divide between the West and the East. Clearly, he's aligned with China. He talked a lot about his economic relations and his strategic relations with China. He talked a lot about the bitterness he had in the Clinton years to try to find a way to to work with the West you know, and again, a lot of manipulation in his tone, a lot of manipulation in his in his uh, his approach in that com- part of the conversation. Um, but nonetheless, he, he sort of is laying the argument here that, hey, what do you want me to do? NATO kept coming up to my border. They didn't think, you know, Russia's no big deal. Everybody's worried about China. You ought to be. They're much bigger than you. They have a better, bigger economy than you and more more capability than you. We got hypersonics. We got this. We got that. You know, he was very casually just laying all of these little talking points to say you should be very, very concerned. At least that's oh, how I, I took I, it. I, I took it the same way. And, and the one compelling argument he had in my mind was the expansion of NATO. And this is something that, you know, candidate Trump in 2016 talked about is what does what is the purpose of NATO today? And when I was a kid, the purpose of NATO was to oppose the Warsaw Pact and, and, and stop the spread of communism through Europe, which it, it effectively did once they ceded half of Europe, by the way, to Stalin. But we won't go down that path. Uh, but, you know, that I thought was his compelling argument. When Poland became a part of NATO, if I'm the Russian president, that sets off alarm bells in my head. What is the United States and the NATO? What are the NATO powers up to? Why are they all around me? Why are they taking former Soviet satellite states into their orbit? And what is the end game here? And yeah. whether and I don't like Vladimir Putin. I don't think any any Western mind can see uh, that he's a good guy. Uh, that part of his argument was quite compelling to me. And then if we did indeed go into Ukraine in 2014, destabilize the government and cause a coup d'état. Well, that was the interesting part. 
Tucker gave him pl- ample opportunity, I would argue. Repeatedly tried to bait Putin into it, I would, I would even suggest, to get Putin to come out and say, the Americans are running this puppet nation uh, uh, led by Zelensky. The Americans are really in charge here. The Americans have, uh, have did the coup on the border. He, he had uh, Tucker tried several times to get him to weigh in on that. Putin avoided those pitfalls. It seemed like every time he wouldn't take the bait, he wouldn't come out and say it. Tucker kept uh, following up with that. Well, don't you think Zelensky is just doing what he's told by the Biden administration? Why don't you just negotiate directly with the Biden administration? Putin kept coming back and saying, listen, he's the elected official, Zelensky. He he could do he's he's in charge. He could negotiate if he wants to. Like, what do you think about that? Uh, it seemed interesting that Putin wouldn't take the bait. I think it's all a political game. And again, this guy is well polished. He's well trained. Uh, you know, he's what, 72 years old, 71, 72 years old. He's been in this game a long time. And um, he, he, he is really looking for a negotiated settlement to stop the attrition of Russian soldiers right now. And he wants to keep the Donbass region in the Russian orbit. And, and then he can do whatever he wants in Ukraine because he has an inroad there. I, I really think that's what he's looking for. If we believe what he said about the Istanbul peace accords, he was ready to sign a deal, Joe. And yeah, uh, well, that was interesting if, too. If he's telling the truth, uh, and and at, I don't believe he's not, because I had heard that there were peace accords and that the West encouraged Ukraine not to sign. I have heard that from other sources other than Vladimir. Yeah, Putin. that that <laughs> so, was reported. That's been reported now for a while. Uh, the prime minister of England at the time, um, Johnson, went over there and basically put an end to that peace uh, deal. And so Vladimir Putin really hammered on that point. But uh, we're going to run out of time here before you know it. Let me just bring this up. I felt like he, when whenever in, issues of faith came up and Tucker sort of gently walked into this, he even sort of asked the question of, to Putin, do you think Debonic forces – I hate my words, not Tucker's. He used different words. But I thought the heart of the question was, do you think demonic forces are at play in the world around us today? Anything on the faith, I felt like Putin was weak sauce. I felt like he he really didn't really uh, ex- show and express his own orthodox Russian faith there. He seems to embrace this more ecumenical approach. Didn't you get that sense? Oh, I, I, I'm glad you brought this up because that was the part of the interview that I was seriously unhappy about was when Tucker asked him about his orthodox faith. He started talking about national identity. Basically, I'm an Orthodox because I'm a Russian, and, and Orthodoxy is the religion of Russia, and it's what contributes to our culture. And, and I heard that, and I said, for a guy who we've read statements from him that are overtly uh, Orthodox Catholic, not Catholic, but Orthodox statements of faith that, that are, we shared with our forebears when we were one, one faith, I, I was shocked that his whole response to his Christian identity was political. And that's what it was, Joe. He he was talking about the politics of being Orthodox, and that's what made him Russian yeah. was that he was Orthodox. And and uh, he's right about one thing. You know, the Black Sea Germans uh, practiced their Catholic faith in, in relative autonomy in modern Russia. They didn't during the Stalin years. Uh, you know, and, and we know that. And and I'm sure some of the Muslims that aren't in Chechnya they get to practice their religion. He talked about that. But I think yeah, it was very very Western oriented answer. It didn't talk about his actual faith. I was proud of we're going to I mean, I was proud of Tucker that towards the end of that, I I think the last 15 minutes was really the best part of the whole interview. Personally, I mean, the rest of it was just kind of meandering a little bit. But uh, I was proud of Tucker to ask Putin directly for the release of that journalist. I I thought that was Tucker putting the hammer down. If anyone doubts that Tucker Carlson, they may not agree with his politics, but he is a real journalist who went in. And in that last 30 minutes of that interview, he hammered Putin pretty hard in a very respectful way. And and from everything I've read, when you interview Putin, you have to tread very lightly because if you insult him, he just gets up and walks away. So I I think Tucker handled it very well. He kept Putin engaged for, what was it, two hours, two hours and a bit. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, you know, he did a nice job. Uh, I have read pre-reports on this interview, by the way, that said if Tucker Carlson doesn't ask for the release, then we just know he's a Putin shill. Well, Tucker had already asked the question on the 6th because the interview was on the 6th. 
And yeah. so I kind of chuckle when I watched the interview and said, you guys don't know Carlson. You, you think he's yeah. something he's not. So that was exactly. the fun part. I, I agree. I agree. Uh, so. I felt like Tucker really couldn't find his footing in the first uh, hour and a half of that uh, interview, though. He was just <laughs> he was a student at the school of Vladimir Putin. And uh, it wasn't until the last 30 minutes that Tucker found found some stride there. So uh, it, it ended better than it started, in my opinion. We are almost out of time here. We didn't even get to James O'Keefe and his undercover video of a Catholic funded migrant secret facility in Tucson, Arizona. So, Mike, if you could jump back on the after show, maybe we can jump into that story. But uh, yikes, Mike, thanks for your input. See you in 35 minutes. Thanks, Joe. All right. 40% say they love the Tucker Carlson, Vladimir Putin interview. 2% said they hated it. 27% said it was interesting. And 31% say not sure. So that poll is up and alive on YouTube. You can go to the station of the cross.com forward slash ACT. You can find the link to the uh, to the live video feed on YouTube there. And you can actually leave your vote, and we'll talk about it more in the after show. But hey, coming up after the break, we're going to have more breaking news and stories for you, of course. And then I'm really excited about this, praise be to God. We're going to get to talk to Eric, our music, about his art, and specifically about Dante's Inferno. To hell and back we go right after this break. Don't go anywhere. More of a Catholic take is headed your way next. What you're offering and giving to me, you deserve to get back because you're offering more than I can give. I learned so much through the station on the cross. I listen to the radio station daily, and I absolutely love it. I was attending the chapel and places like that, and through your programs, I was able to find out how other Protestants had come back into the Catholic Church. God bless the station on the cross. Donate today at thestationofthecross.com. Praise be to Jesus Christ. Welcome back to A Catholic Tick, a bold synthesis of information and inspiration. I'm your host, Joe McLean, and here are your headline news. CNA reports House advances resolution to increase sanctions on Nigeria over persecution of Christians. The House Foreign Affairs Committee has advanced a resolution to increase sanctions and pressure on the Nigerian government over the rampant persecution of Christians and other minorities in the country. Sponsored by Rep. Chris Smith from New Jersey, the resolution would call on the Biden administration to designate Nigeria a country of particular concern. The the resolution would also urge the administration to appoint a special U.S. envoy to Nigeria to monitor and report on incidents of persecution. Let's hope that happens. A Marine Times is reporting five Marines confirmed dead in California helicopter crash. On Wednesday morning, civil authorities found the crash site of the CH-53E Super Stallion helicopter, which had been conducting a routine training flight from Creech Air Force Base, Nevada, to Marine Corps Air Station, Miramar, California. The 3rd Marine Aircraft Wing said it was searching for the five Marines who had been aboard the helicopter, but yesterday morning, it was confirmed the Marines, members of the Air Wing uh, 361st had died after the Tuesday crash. The cause of the crash is still under investigation. Let's, let's pray for their repose. And Breitbart reports GOP calls to invoke the 25th Amendment after special counsel casts doubt on Biden's mental acuity. Following special counsel Robert Herr's report, which included stunning revelations of the deterioration of the president's, uh, President Joe Biden's mental state, claiming he would not be competent to stand trial, Republican officials are calling to invoke the 25th Amendment. They state that, quote, if ever there were a time to do so, now would be it, close quote, and insist that if the president, quote, is not competent to stand trial, then he is certainly not competent to lead the free world, close quote. And those, those are your headline news. Yikes. Hey, uh, praise be to God. Thank you to everybody who's downloaded the iCatholic Radio mobile app and joined the team. We are proud to say that uh, we love being on your team, on your side. Together, amazing things are going to happen. So if you download the iCatholic Radio mobile app today in your iOS or Android app store, you get access to the live radio feed 24-7, clear as crystal, anywhere on planet Earth. It's uh, some great programming there like this one, Mother Miriam, uh, The Simple Truth, of Jim Havens, Ask a Priest Live, Father Mateg, and more, much more. Plus the podcasts are there, the live video feed is there, and more is coming, plus ICR Plus content, the documentary films, some talks. Uh, and so I encourage you, join the team today. Download the iCatholic Radio mobile app in your iOS or Android app store. We would love, 
love, love to have you on the team today. All right. Uh, I want to talk about artwork. Um, I am not at all inclined from an artistic perspective, and uh, I'm sure that's by design. But I, I'm blown away when I see artwork that's compelling, interesting, captivating, and when I saw this, uh, I was on my scroll. I was scrolling. I think it was on LinkedIn, if I wasn't, if I'm not mistaken. And I came across Eric and his artwork on Dante's Inferno. And I got to say, it really caught my attention here. And I think it's it's just really incredible. So I've invited him to be on, and he's joining us now. Good morning to you, Eric. Our music. Good morning, Joe. How are you? Praise be to God. I am alive, and that counts. How are you? Amen to that. I agree. <laughs> let's talk very, about very, your very artwork great. i want to talk about your dante's inferno in particular but before we do that let me get to know you just really quickly here how long have you been painting how long have you been doing this kind of artwork and how has your catholic faith uh, informed your artwork well um i can say that from birth even i i was always drawing always you know interested in you know, playing around with pencils as a kid, but no real direction until college. Never got the opportunity to study art history or painting or anything else like that until I was in college. So, um, and I think that's really where everything kind of clicked for me because I remember my first art history class uh, looking at a Caravaggio, I believe it was the uh, inspiration of St. Matthew. And it really kind of clicked for me that, wow, I've been studying art history actually my whole life because I'm um, a cradle Catholic. I uh, grew up in these beautiful churches as a kid, uh, looking at the ceilings, the walls, um, the stained glass work, and everything that was around me uh, while I was at Mass every weekend. And uh, that that whole thing kind of drew me into uh, what I really wanted to do for a living. And eventually I ended up going to Italy. And I think it just absolutely clicked seeing all the beautiful artwork uh, in the churches and at the Vatican in Florence and, and Venice and Rome. And I came home and I told my professors, this is what I want to do for a living. And they all laughed at me. <laughs> and they said, you'll never, you'll never make a living. You'll, you'll never make a living doing this. It's, it's antiquated and, and done and gone. And um, I, fortunately, I'm a very stubborn person. And I said, well, I'm going to show you guys. And um, <laughs> it's kind of funny now, you know, uh, this year is 30 years I've been in uh, business as a professional. And uh, I will say it's, it's absolutely not just informed my business, but it's absolutely been the, the um, foundation of my business. Um, when you're embarking on something like this, which is a very entrepreneurial kind of uh, job, you know, most people will say, oh, you can't, you can't make a living as an artist. Well, I'm here 30 years later. I'm here right now. I have oh, a family of five. I've supported all of us. Uh, but uh, it, it really did come down to resting on my faith all the time, you know, really mm. having no plan most of the time, like where was the business going to come from? You know, what, what was going to be the next thing that came through? And, and when it's, when you kind of rest your life on that and you have faith and pray as a family and uh, even through the hardest of storms that we went through, um, there's always something there. Like it's always that next thing leading you to that next part of business. And I've had the pleasure of doing some incredible commissions for churches um, some enormous sales of my art, uh, the value I've built into my own brand because I kind of had to walk my own path in the art business. Uh, this type of art really wasn't accepted, especially 30 years ago. No one was doing even much uh, faith-based artwork. And getting involved in, in, in starting to decide you're going to do that kind of work in the very beginning was, you know, that was, you know, you're blazing your own path. And yeah. uh, so there's really no, there was nothing to rely on, no galleries, no, you know, your typical things that artists do. So I really had to, you know, kind of blaze that. And it's really interesting now, after all these years, I've been teaching 20 years of my business. And now I teach a lot of other younger students how to do um, religious artwork. And uh, it's so beautiful to see the scene really starting to open up, really grow. A lot of Catholics, you know, beginning uh, to believe that they can do this for a living and, and, you know, building their own businesses. And I'm, I'm, even though I went through a lot of ups and downs on my own, I can use my experiences to kind of wield them into a position yeah. and say, do this, don't do this, F focus on this now, um, mm. come and study with me for a week here and there. I've had people from all around the world actually come and study with me, um, where yeah, that's almost the greatest thing is now I can give back uh, all the experiences that I had, good or bad, they made me 
where I am today and the success I have is because of that. And uh, mm. so now I've been able to kind of take that successful end and, and pass it on and, and uh, grow it even larger, so it's become much bigger than me. And um, so I have that side of my business and I have also the, uh, the, the, the opportunity to create art for churches and, and put my artwork out there and, and it'll be here hundreds of years, hopefully after I'm gone and it's inspiring Amen. people. To great Let's deep, up. Deep need. Let, let's talk about Dante's Inferno. We're going to be up against a, a radio break here in just a few minutes, but I want to get into Dante's Inferno. Obviously an epic, right? Dante going in, uh, you know, Virgil taking him on the journey of the nine uh, nine circles of hell. And right. uh, it's we all had to at least read, the, if nothing else, you studied the summary notes, the cliff note. You bought the cliff notes in high school. If you didn't read the thing, you're at least familiar with it, right? So It's so yeah, widely I- accepted. How long have you been painting your panels uh, on, so tell me about the actual artwork. What's the style? What's the medium? Why did you want to uh, paint Dante's Inferno? How did you break this up? Uh, can you, just tell me about it. Right. Well, uh, all, the, all the the specifics are all the paintings. Uh, there, I'm going to do 40 paintings that are uh, four foot by five foot paintings. So they're not quite life sized, um, but they're very large so that it's it's really going to create a space when you see all these paintings together. Because think about it, four foot wide by 40 that's 160 feet of painting um so it would be literally like if it's in a museum it's gonna you know someone can walk in and actually kind of go through that whole trail of the inferno from beginning to end and uh, maybe it'll progress when i'm finished with this to the purgatorio and and uh, to the paradiso as well um wow. but uh my my impetus for this was i i remember receiving a book uh my mother bought me uh i was in college uh, of Dante's Inferno, it was a translation, and I remember reading it. And the illustrations were just some modern art garbage. It, it just, I'm, I'm reading this amazing text, and I'm thinking, that's what you got, the artist. Uh, you know, that's what you created. Looking at this, like, come on, that we can do better than that. And uh, so, but I, I didn't have the skills, I didn't have the technique, I didn't have the resources or anything else then. Um, and it wasn't until 2016 that um, I was kind of out of crux in my life, you know, really rebuilding from, you know, all the events in the late 2008 and, and on. And I'm just kind of looking for like, what is what is that one thing that's going to kind of propel me forward? And I thought, why aren't there any, why aren't there artists getting like Sistine Chapel level commissions anymore? Like, wh- where is that? And I thought, well, if someone isn't going to commission it, I'm going to commission it for myself. I'm going to, I'm going to make this immense epic series something that no one's ever done before and i'm just going to go about it myself i have no idea how i'm going to do it but god will make a way and little by little all the pieces started falling into place i I found a a, a wonderful gentleman uh, from university of wisconsin madison he was a retired professor of medieval uh, literature Um, he's been my advisor with this we're going to do a book together I got sponsored by Jerry's Artorama for a lot of the art materials. So that's enabled a lot of this to be built. I've sold some of the panels as well. Um, so little by little, it, it was just go forward. Don't be afraid with the, the, the idea and it'll, it'll materialize with the way it needs to. And, uh, and, and as it stands now, I'm, I'm on about the 15th panel out of the uh, 40. Wow. Uh, that I've that I've worked on for the last uh, six or seven years. I was hoping to get through it a lot quicker, um, but it's it's it is the most uh, incredibly challenging. Uh, <laughs> I, th- I think that's you funny. Like, oh, You're like I hope I, I I hope I could get through this quicker. Like it would take me a billion years, and I still wouldn't get to what you've done already to this point. What do you call? I mean, I guess would you say art is subjective? I mean, I. I suppose it is, but at the same time, I believe that almost that everyone recognizes uh, skill. They recognize beauty. They recognize something very special. And to to give you an example, you mentioned Caravaggio. I was just in Rome filming a documentary film back in uh, November, and I went to uh, to the Church of uh, of King Saint Louis the Ninth, and everybody rushed in not to go to the altar. They rushed in to go see the Caravaggios in the back left corner. You know? <laughs> so, like, and, and, you know, they didn't stop to genuflect at the tabernacle. Right. They were just rushed. So my point being, like, people all over the world recognize something that stands out to them. And I felt like your art did that for me when I was scrolling. I stopped scrolling. It caught my attention. I was like, wow, what do you call – is this, like, photorealistic style? What's the style of artwork that you are employing uh, here? 
Yeah, I would definitely say it, it, everything I've ever been inspired by is probably 400 years old. Uh, I, I really, some stuff I pay attention to in our modern world. And, and obviously the models that I use to pose these, these uh, characters and everything are from our modern world. It's my interpretation. But everything tends to be very old Baroque. Uh, looking, there's maybe some uh, influence from uh, maybe like 19th century uh, French Academy uh, artists as well. You know that classical, neoclassical look to certain things. Um, I enjoy that as well. But um, I would, I would definitely say, you know, I, I agree with you to that to that point that um, you know art being subjective. I mean, do we have to tell somebody that a sunset is beautiful or not? You know, there's there's certain things that we're we're innately drawn to when we see it. And I wanted to create a series that was unlike what I had seen in that book that I mentioned earlier. I, I didn't want to be told it was art. I didn't want to be told that it was it was this or that part of whatever canto and that in the inferno. Like I really wanted people to experience it, to almost see the real characters in real life playing these scenes out around them. So then they walked in this this, you know, exhibit space. They literally felt like they're entering into the inferno. And, mm. and, and they couldn't help but, but be a part of it and, and experience it. Hold that thought. Eric, our music is our guest. We're talking about his, his work, Dante's Inferno series. We're going to be linking to it in the show notes for you over at thestationofthecross.com forward slash ACT, but it's ericarmusic.com. That's A-R-M-U-S-I-K, ericarmusic.com. Check that website out. But on the other side of the break, I want to get to know a little bit more about the process. Uh, you know, my daughter, she's an artist. She likes to paint. I don't relate. I don't speak the language. I can't understand the skill level. So it, it amazes me to see sort of behind the scenes of it. So where does he get his models? How does he choose faces to put in the artwork? Kind of reminds me of Michelangelo and many others. We'll be right back. More is coming up next. Don't go anywhere. Be to Jesus Christ. Welcome back to A Catholic Take, a bold synthesis of information and inspiration. I'm your host, Joe McLean. It is so good to be on with you. We're talking to Eric R. Music about his artwork. And again, you can find his website linked up in the show notes today at the station of the cross.com forward slash ACT. We want to encourage you to join the email list, by the way, while you're there. Get access to the back end to the insider telegram group to a bunch of other goodies as well at the station of the cross.com forward slash ACT. But Eric's website is ericarmusic.com. That's A R M U S I K. And you can see his artwork there. Plus he, he teaches. So this is another opportunity. If you know an artist in your life, maybe Eric's the right resource to help that person grow as an artist, maybe learn how to make a living. Wouldn't that be amazing? Because I am of the opinion that if I had George Soros kind of cash, if I was Elon Musk, I wouldn't be building space rockets as much as I'd be promoting Catholic art, Catholic filmmaking, Catholic artistry, and a, a new uh, and a proper, I would argue, era of Renaissance. And Eric, welcome back to the show. Let's talk about that a little bit behind the scenes. I was just thinking about the film The Agony and the Ecstasy, Charlton Heston. It's a classic, boy. It's such a good film. And uh, it's about the painting of the Sistine Chapel. And many of those artists would paint figures into these epic pieces that millions of people travel around the world to go see every year. And hidden inside these uh, inside these images are like the faces of actual people, the faces of prelates or their enemies are painted in hell or whatever. So I wanted to ask you, did you put any enemies in hell? I'm just curious. How did you decide <laughs> on the actual faces and the images? Where did you get the inspiration for the, the people that you painted? Well, um, you know, to answer your question, I haven't I haven't put any enemies yet, but um, <laughs> there's certainly some people on this earth today that uh, will definitely be inspiring some of the characters for sure. Uh, but I, I use a, a combination of some models that are professional that do this. Um, I've used them in other works uh, all throughout my career, um, but some of them just happen to be people that live even in my immediate area here. There could be somebody I just met at the supermarket, could be uh, a, a friend of you know uh, of the family or something like that. I think even my my wife's um, cousin is uh, is actually my model for Dante. Uh, a neighbor down the other end of town is a model for Virgil and and, and a few others. Uh, so I I basically try to resource when I see somebody in public, kind of uh, go to them and uh, introduce myself and and give them a, a card. And sometimes they'll 
there'll be a model sometimes who look at you like you've got three heads and <laughs> that's right yeah. and uh, i will say no but uh but it's always a great experience like that i've i've oh, throughout the years and in, in fact i i found my uh the big joke in my house is i found my model for jesus at a pizza shop uh like uh, back in 2010 uh with my with my children in tow i i had no idea if he'd be spooked off or not but he ended up being uh, a model for me for a number of years and um it was a great yeah, relationship yeah i can imagine so yeah, it is it nice. something about the is it something about the look in their eyes is it the shape of their face i mean what what is it as an artist that when you see someone's face you're like i i need that i need to put that in my work right i think the deepest the deepest part is the face i think there's so much modern art today that doesn't focus on the human emotion the the innocence the uh the emotions of a human being everybody's you know painting humans in in, in very you know, not not celebrating life and things like that. Um, when I see a, a person in, in in public, you know, it could be just the emotions they're giving when they're talking to their family or to their children. I'll see a, an expression on their face. It'll be a sympathetic person or something like that. Um, that really makes me right away be kind of struck with, wow, they would make a great blank. Um, you know, whatever the person uh, that I'm looking for would be. Um, and then other times it might be just looking at some of my model resources where, you know, I found a great model for, uh, my Mary, um, from one of my sites that I work with. And it just so happened she was, she's from Israel and she's married to a man named Joseph with a beard. So it, wow. I mean, talk about what, a, what an interesting thing. So it's sometimes you, you, you get even more than you thought, just kind of being curious and asking, but I never do any work without having real people. And I think that's why I love Caravaggio because, he employed real people in his work. You saw saints with dirty feet. You saw, you know, real people with real emotions, not these idealized people that might be bigger than us and, and, and separated from us. But he, he really grounded it. And I thought, again, from the very first time I saw his work, wow, like we can all be saints. We can all find that calling. It, we, we, we all have that choice if we're given. Um, and I think that that kind of found its way through all the subjects I deal with, whether it's religious art, um, Dante's Inferno here, historical pieces I've painted over the years and other subjects we'd have seen 500 years ago. Um, I'm always trying to use that kind of, you know, reality of a, of a human being really acting these scenes out, not just inventing them so it, it, it wouldn't make that connection you know, with people. I really want them people to feel like a real connection with the characters uh, that are in my artwork where where do the panels live right now and uh, do you have a plan for when you complete the entire project is there a plan and a vision for how they will be used where they'll be displayed who gets to see them um they, they will initially I, I i actually have sold a few of them um in the beginning i started putting this out there i did find a couple buyers for um some of the pieces which has enabled me to you know paint for a few few years and and you know actually dedicate some time to it um until the pandemic and then you know since then i've, I've taken on a lot more commission work so now it's you know this this might seem like a really big series dante's inferno in in my life but i probably do about four or five times as much church commissions and other commission work where i'm i'm putting out a lot of artwork uh to, to keep things going but to answer your question most of the panels are here now except for the ones that that have sold um I actually have one of them. I don't know if you, I could sit to the side of me Go here. Go for it. Kind of see, so uh, for our radio audience, he's panning the camera over right now so we can see, yeah. we can see, yeah, uh, can see. Uh, an example of one oh, of the panels. The panels are huge, by the way. Yeah. So they're, they're about, you know, five feet tall. Which one is um, the one you're showing us right now? Can you explain the one? Uh, can you describe that yeah. for us? Well, one of the most famous, famous statements you're going to see is it's this. Actually, this is the print of it. Um, it's Dante and Virgil at the mouth of, of hell, where it has the, uh, the sign right above it, abandon all hope ye who enter here, um, in old Latin. Um, and this is uh, actually the, the original piece. This is going to the collector soon. I'm, I'm actually framing it and giving it to him. Uh, wow. but this is, this is what one of the prints looks like, um, that I've produced from there. So, uh, and I have about a dozen of them that are still um, in my in my storage right now. Once uh, I get everything finished, all 40, they're going to go into a museum show. I'm hoping to do a museum show in America first, but I do have 
uh, some uh, connections in Florence uh, where they would like to uh, exhibit it there. So oh. that's going to be you know quite a bit uh, to make the arrangements for that because 40 paintings, the size, the um, amount of uh, you know creating and everything else is going to be quite substantial. But uh, I think the experience being able to show everybody that much uh, artwork in one space and really transforming an environment is going to be very beautiful. So I've, I've kind of, I'm going to be taking back the ones that have sold from their collections and temporarily letting them go off to uh, be exhibited. And then once the show's over or shows, if it travels, um, then it can return to the collectors and then they'll all be individually uh, available for purchase uh, from my. That's amazing. Uh, so the prints of your panels, are those available to purchase? Yes, actually, the ones that have sold, um, as I said, I have uh, the this uh, Canto 3. I have um, Canto 4, which is uh, Dante and Virgil in limbo with uh, all of the, uh, the great poets of antiquity. And uh, this one, which I just finished last year, um, this oh, wow. Celestial Messenger. Um, uh, this one is Canto 9. And... Um, uh, that particular model was uh, from uh, Lowe's that I found in this. <laughs> uh, <laughs> they played uh, my, my uh, archangel in that piece. So, uh, it's kind of funny. But, I can uh, imagine that's kind of an awkward conversation. Hi, how you doing? You don't know me. Can I paint you? <laughs> like, Just yeah. a little bit. <laughs> like, okay, weirdo. <laughs> uh, Eric, your artwork is amazing. Uh, thank you for sharing it with us today. I really appreciate that. Uh, I'm going to encourage everybody to check out your website, ericrmusic.com. That's A-R-M-U-S-I-K, ericrmusic.com. Check it out. We'll put a link to it in the show notes to make it easy for you. But, Eric, God bless you and God love you. Thank you and have a great day. God bless you too, Joe. Thank you so much. Go to thestationofthecross.com forward slash A-C-T. God love you and God bless you. And we are back. Welcome to the after show and happy Friday, everyone. Happy Friday. Praise be to God. Any artists in the in the group here? I thought I saw some chat chatter about that, but I well, couldn't put, pay too much attention to that. But if you are if you are an artist, let us know in the chat box. I'd love to know it. Hey Janice, good morning to you. Paul, good morning to you. Jen Nugent, good morning to you. Laura L, good morning to you. Praise be to God. Damon, Kathleen, and Sharon. Glad you guys are on the team today. Yvonne, I see you there. Good morning to you. James 16897, good morning to you. Praise be to God. Glad you're on the team today. Of course, uh, Nick the Mike is here. Mimi's here. T-Storm's here. Glad uh, you guys are all here this morning. Mike K is back in the uh, back on the, uh, the the stream this morning. Good morning to you. Thanks for hanging out with yeah, us Yeah, you today. messed up letting me come back, Joe. What oh, were man. you thinking? <laughs> uh, well, I'm not the producer. Jake's the producer, so you can blame I can, Jake. I can turn Mike off He's the gatekeeper, not me. Yeah, praise be to you God. just let anyone on this show man come just, on twice apparently <laughs> apparently hey james 16 uh, 897 is also on the rumble this morning good morning to you len pine sci-fi mike is here Pra praise be to god good morning to you D james says i can't draw a stick figure with a compass and a ruler yeah <laughs> and amen brother I i'm right there with you i'm right there with you honey west 25 good morning thanks for hanging out with us today Glad you guys are here. If you're on the Rumbles and you've never commented before, why not make today the, that day? Let's just join the team today. Let us know where you are from. Hey, Junior Barra, Don Paddock, good morning to you. Mimi, good morning to you from the Hill Country. Patty is here as well. Glad to see you guys here. Thanks for hanging out. Praise be to God. Is the media you paint always on canvas? Uh, Don, I'm sorry I didn't ask that question. Those panels were, by the way, on metal. Uh, I want to say mm. those were, did he say aluminum or steel? I forget. I think he said aluminum, but aluminum I, might, I, might panels. Be, I might be wrong. Joe, you are amazing. God bless you, my friend. Thank you for your generosity today. Uh, thank you for that. Paul, Paulu, Paulu. I hope I say that correctly, Joe. But either way, I'm grateful that you're on the team. Thank you, Robert. Good morning to you. Female KC Royals fan from Nebraska. Good morning to you. Praise be to God. Deborah, Paul. Caleb, the mechanic, is back. Little Daisy's in the house. Catherine Hickey, good morning to you. Pola Chicho, my friend, good morning to you. Jeff Burrier is here. Alex, Jeff, how, weren't you supposed to have surgery, Jeff? Like, I'm praying for your surgery, bro. Is that today? When is that? Let me know. Pray for Jeff. Uh, Alexandria Hall, good morning to you. Round one, hello to you. Ruben Martinez, good morning to you. Anatola, good morning to you. Evelyn, or is it Evelyn? 
Colored Pencil 101 is in the house. Good morning to you. Praise be to God. And I'm glad you're a Catholic artist. That's awesome. I wish I, I, I'm, I wanted to ask Eric. I it ran out of time. But like, okay, Colored Pencil 101, I'm going to ask you the question because Eric's not here. Can anybody actually learn to paint or draw? Is it like, because I, I asked uh, the, 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 the March of the Goblins guy, remember that? I asked him, hey, can anybody... Can anybody just is it is it a factor of perseverance? Like if I just muscle through with sheer determination, could I actually get there on playing the violin at like high level? He's like, no, of course not. You got to be born with certain amount of aptitude and skill, inspiration. He said anybody can force themselves to play, but only people who have this God given uh, a skill will get to that level. Is that also true for things like art and singing? If I just sure pure uh, willpower, could I learn to draw? Uh, Colored Pencils 101, I'd like to know what your thoughts are on that. Uh, Troy Lockett, Colleen, Diane, good morning to you. Uh, Laris, good morning to you. Colin, Paul, Chesty Marine is in the house. Yvonne, good morning to you. Xavier Ray, good morning to you. Praise be to God. Glad you're here. Wasn't that, uh, he says, cool house. Wasn't it like the, like his house is pretty baller, man. It's like pretty cool looking. <laughs> I did like that. That was awesome. KSB, good morning to you. Janice, glad you're on the team. Alberto, my friend, explain to me uh, the, the Prime Minister Johnson Act. Like what, what, why, why did Johnson go and scuttle the whole peace deal? It seemed like that's, that would have been a good thing for the hundreds of thousands that are casualties now out of that conflict. Uh, anyway, um, let's see here. Scrolling backwards, scrolling backwards, scrolling back. Jessica Boggs, good morning to you. Glad you're on the team today. Thanks for doing it. Uh, Caleb the Mechanic says, you might not master it, but I've taught many people to draw. Oh, really? Caleb the Mechanic, you're an artist. That's amazing. In painting and drawing, you can. You can with sheer sheer willpower, you're saying. Huh. Well, um, Joe, you can learn to play the guitar through sheer willpower. And, and I don't know. I have. You and I, I have. Know. But I, I, listen. <laughs> I don't consider not, what I do playing the guitar personally. But I consider what being, I do you're never, therapy. You're never going to play it at the level of a, of a Steve Howe or a... Uh, <laughs> or my son, or a, even. Yeah. Or, you know, well, <laughs> you know, the guys who are the masters, Jimi Hendrix, uh, you know, those guys... They had something you and I don't have. Uh, and listen, I, you know I make music. You know I write music. I tried and tried. I have never mastered an instrument, no matter how much I tried. And and you know there has to be a sheer force of will if uh, 40 years later I'm still writing songs and trying to do it. So <laughs> it's, it's, it's just it's an impossibility for some of us. We just don't have that God-given talent, and, and you just try to make the most of what you have. Whereas, you know, guys like our, our producer here, Jake— uh, Man has a voice. He can sing, and, and you know it, yeah. it's, it's a gift. And where's so. Tweed in the process? <laughs> if only so I worked he hard makes, and practiced, I could actually. He makes really it look good. easy, is what he does. <laughs> that's, that's the problem. Well, you know, other other than his inability to grow a proper mustache. Ouch! I mean, he's, it's he's, he's getting there. Talented. It's getting darker every day. Stop it. Yeah, shoe polish doesn't count, Joe. Oh, <laughs> ouch! Ouch! Put a little I milk on too, that. Let the kitty lick it off. Hey, Jeff. Oh, Barrier's he's going to put him a shoe polish on voila. it. Voila. <laughs> voila. Voila. I knew he was French this whole time. I knew it. I oh, knew that's it. the mustache. It brings out the French in me. Wee oui, wee. Oui. Oh, hey, Jeff Burrier is headed to the doctors now. So if you guys could keep Jeff Burrier in your prayers today, he's going for a major surgery. Yeah. We'd be grateful to you. Uh, Catherine Hickey says, I'm living proof. Some people are not meant to draw. <laughs> Yay and amen. I'm on your team, Catherine. Color Pencil 101 says, yes, you can certainly learn the skills, but you may not reach the level of Eric or myself. Well, I'm jealous. <laughs> I'm super jealous. I, I, um, I can't I, draw anything. Like, I've tried. Can I, I've tried. Can I share something I learned late in life? And maybe, maybe Mike, you might be able to relate because you, you are of even higher vintage than I am. <laughs> Better, better was the word you were looking for, there, Joe. Mm, mm-hmm. That's that's <laughs> certainly an option. Certainly one of the options. The older the uh, wine, the good. I is. wish I had known this when I was younger. Even though it was taught to me when I was younger, I didn't listen. I was too busy doing bad things to pay attention to wisdom. 
you can put anything you put your mind to. Almost, right? Like, climb a mountain? Okay. Uh, go to the moon? Yes, I could go to the moon. Of course. I don't care what Jake says. I could do it, 100%. <laughs> go to Mars? Yeah, I could do that. Go to the bottom of the ocean? I can do that, too. No problem. Play guitar? Sure. Sit back and watch. I'll, I'll figure this out somehow, some way. As long as I'm willing to, to persevere until the end, I've learned that there's a superpower of applying your effort, your mind, your intention, your willpower, your sheer determination to never quit towards a goal, towards a task, and you can accomplish that. You know, producing a documentary film, you know, filming it, traveling, editing, producing, all of it, it's hard. Let me tell you, hundreds and hundreds of hours went into the film we released in December, and I'm not that great at it, but sheer determination will go go a long, long way. But to the point we said earlier, that gets you to here where everybody else is here, but the greats are there, right? So... Never going to be great at anything. Are, greats are twice as high as wherever you end up, and that's that's Pretty reality. By the way, Joe, and, and mm. you know you're not aware of this, but I'll say it, and, and this is not pandering in any any stretch of the imagination. But you make what you do look really easy. And having <laughs> sat in that chair, whatever, having dude. sat in that chair and <laughs> had to try to do it, and Jake will tell you. He's, he's talked me off the ledge more than once before the show started because it is it is intimidating to be in that chair, not only from the standpoint of you don't want to mess up, you don't want to get in trouble with the FCC, uh, you don't want to do all those things. Uh, the other thing is when you deliver that gospel message, you have taken on a uh, a burden that you will be judged for in the next life. And that yeah. is terrifying to, to anyone, I think, who, who believes in the almighty and all-powerful God. Yeah. That is a terrifying Amen. spot to be in. And well Joe, said. you do that with just... Ah, oh, no way, bro. <laughs> in fact, I want to chime in on that. You, you, you triggered me on something with Tucker Carlson last night. But first, let me say, Chris Anderson says, I just want to go to heaven. This is much work for me. Yay and Amen. <laughs> Amen. This is the perseverance that we need to apply the most towards, right? To, to persevere until the end with fear and trembling, working out our salvation. Our Lord makes it clear. I was It was someone who commented on something I said on Twitter on X the other day. They were scandalized by all the scandals in the church, and they were basically leaving the church to go Lutheran. And I'm like, you don't leave Jesus because of Judas. Well, I've got my faith. That and a nickel get you nowhere because, you know, Christ only founded one church. He's got one body and one church. And you don't leave Judas simply because of the scandal. You know, you don't leave Jesus because of Judas. And um, and I, I, I reminded this person uh, with with charity. I said, you know, Matthew... Matthew's gospel, our Lord said very clear that only those who persevere until the end get to enjoy the bennies, right? So perseverance requires sure determination on our part. So thanks, Chris, for reminding of that, reminding us of that. Um, you, you just triggered me a little bit. That's your well, God given uh, talent, you know. Joan. And I'll, let me say this, because when I was watching, when I was watching Tucker last night to go, let's go back to Tucker by the way, uh, so the results of the poll so far it was the Tucker. Did you like the Tucker Carlson Vladimir Putin interview? 35% say yes. 1% say hated it. 37% said it was interesting. 27% not sure. If you haven't voted, please consider voting. It's over on YouTube right now. Lynn Pine, good morning to you. Sci-Fi Mike. Sharon is on the team today as well. Good morning to you. Thank you. KB, good morning to you. Praise be to God. Um. So I was watching Tucker, and like I said, the first hour and a half, Tucker is a school child at the school of Vladimir Putin. You know, what was yep. that? What was the scene in, Red, in Hunt for Red October? And uh, oh. the two sub, the two Russian sub captains, one's the student and one's the master, school master. It's like, that's the scene that popped into my head for starters. But I'm going to say only, this. Not only was he in school, but Putin handed him the textbook. He said, That's here's exactly your reading. Right. Here's your homework. <laughs> However, and, and, and without exaggerating, I have literally interviewed thousands of people over the last 20 years of doing media. I would not have performed nearly as well as Tucker did. Vladimir Putin would have, would have made me look utterly ridiculous. I'm, I'm not even exaggerating. I really believe that. I believe... That I, I mean, I have the, like I've never sat in front of someone like a Vladimir Putin. Like, I, could I? Could I stand my ground? Like, could I, with as much deference, with as much skill, with as much patience as Tucker Carlson had to have 
to go through 45 minutes of a history lesson and not upset the apple cart to the point where Vlad gets up and walks off, but to keep him on the conversation to the point where Tucker got to end it, right? It was at the end of it. It was like complete opposite. It was schoolboy in the beginning and then master at the end, because at the end, Tucker was the one who decided when to end this thing. Tucker does this thing, and I've caught on to it a long time ago. When you're uh, bloviating on something he really doesn't care about or he thinks you're just insane, he looks at you, he cocks his head, he opens his mouth, and he just stares at you. Yeah. And he he did that the yeah. entire first half hour. Yes. Yes. He, he's just it's so true. At like, this is Tucker. <laughs> The whole time, the entire conversation, you know, it's like I was telling, I was telling Jake this the other day, like, I'm going to, okay, I'm just going to, I'm just being honest. I'm explaining, not complaining. All right. It's a little caveat here, but when I'm interviewing somebody, I'm going to be honest. I'm only 75% engaged. The other 25% is wondering why I just screwed up the camera switching. You know, me taking my glasses off and on, looking over to the chat box or something else or just some sort of distraction. Like, you know what I mean? Like, so my brain is, is you know, as Rush Limbaugh, he was only 50% involved. The other half of his brain was tied behind his back. You know, there's something to that. It's hard to be absolutely consumed by the conversation and be totally present. It is incredibly hard to do that when you're doing a lot of the mechanics in the back end. Tucker Carlson not, obviously doesn't have that problem. He does. He's got people who will do everything else. Jake, it's not that he won't do everything else. It's just that our system, the way it's all set up here, uh, we are trying to punch above our weight. So we are having to to duct duct tape several things together to make it all work. Jake is just not capable. He's not able. He doesn't have the technical uh, ability to control my cameras, for instance, or whatever. I can't believe you actually got me yesterday to say, hey, give me more things to do during the show. I, exactly. <laughs> yes. We are in a meeting we were talking well, about. No, the, the, the reality is, more. is Limbaugh had a whole team of six, seven people in the booth who right. were doing the work he was doing. Yeah. And, 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 you know, you're a two, two-man operation there during the show, during the show. Right. And the other thing is, is, is the things that you have to conquer. And this is a little behind baseball here, but Jake comes in your ear and says, 60 seconds left. It's hard not to want to say, okay, thanks, Jake. Yeah. You, know, you just yes. got to keep on rolling. <laughs> the other thing, Joe, yeah. that I learned my very first show where you were gone and you said, would you guest host? I spilled the entire 40 ounce cup of coffee in my lap as Good the times. music was coming into the, onto, to open it uh, bro, up. Bro, I've me. been there. I've done that. <laughs> and, <laughs> and then I ended the prayer and forgot to, to do the sign of the cross and, and Bro, I'm like, i can't no. even remember my own tagline i don't want to hear it okay listen please well, the funny it's my thing show is, and I, I screwed up all the time so my the I mean, voice in my it head which was joy mcclain was joe mcclain joe mcclain said to me once he said you just keep pushing because i had been a guest and i messed up once and so i just kept on pushing i didn't acknowledge it i didn't talk about it i just kept on rocking and yeah. and joe you do that all the time and and it's hard though i know but i I just wanted to say that I, although I am slightly critical of Tucker Carlson in this interview, I don't want to. I don't want it to be thought that I didn't recognize, as somebody who's done this, that he's at a level above. Right? He he is definitely. I I believe he's at a level above because, like, if you watch a lot of uh, talking head commentators who are like national, international figures, you know, Stephanopoulos or. Or or Cronkite, or the lady on poor, on poor, Christiana on poor. You can her name, name anybody yeah. you want. Raymond Dororio. I'd put Raymond Dororio up there. Guess what? Raymond's got a clipboard with all the questions. Or nowadays, he's got a, an iPad or or an iPhone on his lap, looking down. They're all they're all doing it. What did Tucker have in his lap? Just curious. Nothing. Nothing. Tucker was there. He was present. He was. Listening, he tried to interject in that first hour and a half. Putin schooled him, told him to shut up, sit down, and listen. So he could have he could have gotten feisty, and he probably would have lost it all. He used prudential judgment, kept Putin on the hook, kept him talking, and was able to ask him, you know. And then out of nowhere comes a comes a left a left jab. Who bombed this? Who bombed the pipeline? You did. I was busy that day. Like, man, 
fucking baller moment. Just baller <laughs> moment. An hour and a half of 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 a college history lecture to who bombed the pipeline? You did. I was busy that day. <laughs> like, bro, you just showed your chops, man. That was so good. So I just from like a, a mechanic perspective, like a like a guy who does this kind of work, but not at that level, just my mind went at that moment. It just took an hour and a half to get there. The first hour and a half, I was like, oh, come on, Tucker. Jump in, bro. This guy's got you on the ropes, man. And nah, he uh, didn't. He didn't. <laughs> it was so funny, man. That's just hilarious. No, it was but, it uh, was there were there were a few moments. The big issue is, Joe, and and, and I'm I'm learning this in nego because a discussion on the radio is a negotiation and, and my professional life negotiation is a big part of what I do. And you cannot be thinking of the next question while the person is talking. <laughs> and that is tough not to want to do, particularly if you're someone who has a love of, of, of uh, discussion uh, where oh, as soon as Joe finishes, I'm going to ask him this question. You can't do that. And Tucker doesn't do that. And so yeah. for him to come back with, oh, I was, I was busy that day. That, I mean, that was quick. <laughs> that was good, <laughs> man. That was so good. That was so good. That was so good. That and was... Putin chuckled. Putin thought I was that like, was funny. <laughs> as soon as I, I know, that's what I loved about it was like because Tucker and Putin obviously were able to have a little tit for tat, right? Like this guy, this guy's no joke. He you was KGB. Mm-hmm. He was, you know, you don't, you, you don't, you're not 20 years in power in Russia and not not be a gangster, right? Like this guy's mob material. Like the mob is is not as good as this guy. So I mean, I but I I'll say this. I ho- I had hoped that Tucker would ask some other kinds of questions um, that he didn't of like, for instance, like the, um, the Wagner group boss, all of a sudden mysteriously dying in a plane crash. Yeah. How do you explain that? Vlad explain that one to me, Vlad, you know, like I he didn't even go I there. Like, I would have liked him to push Putin on the denazification term that he keeps using. And, and well, he uh, talked about that. They talked about that. Well, but he, he didn't push back on it. Like I'd hoped, you know, uh, while while he's talking about denazification, uh, have you done anything to decommunize your country? Uh, yeah. You know that would have been yeah. a, an equally, uh, you know, as, as bad okay. as Hitler was. Stalin was just as bad. Come on. <laughs> yeah, Stalin was <laughs> ta- Stalin was uh, Stalin was was horrible, and uh, and he was simply Lenin two point oh. In fact, many people believe he poisoned Lenin in order to take absolute authority. Oh, yeah. Stalin was probably possessed by the by a demon, but nonetheless, um, just look how slick Putin was in the whole thing. Uh, let me tell you a story. Doesn't name names. This is like all parable material here. Once there was a guy, and he killed a man, and he went to prison. But the man he killed, oh man, this guy was really bad. You know, so like was he, he bad? Cars like, over the head. Like, you know, nine I mean? people like, up on the road. You know, like. <laughs> Like, like he was just telling these like generic stories with no names and just the way he was doing it. It was just like Vlad, man, Vlad. Like, oh man, it was hilarious. You, you got to imagine. Yeah. You got to imagine the fervor at the CIA headquarters watching that interview last night, trying to analyze body language and and trying to read between the lines and figure out what's what he's saying. I would love to have been a fly on the wall, uh, you know, of these analysts reviewing this content, this material. It would have been amazing. Yeah, exactly. It would have been, it would have been amazing. <laughs> I, I, but, uh, I do think it's funny that they also probably got on the edge of their seat every time he would start with, I was once talking to your President Clinton. And then what's he going to say? Know. What's he going to reveal? What's like, he going to reveal? <laughs> Hillary Clinton goes off on the, on the, whole, the whole Tucker Carlson being a dog uh, you know, for uh, for Vlad, for for Putin, and Putin has this wonderful chance to talk about what he knows or doesn't know about about uh, the Clintons, and doesn't do it. Why? Nope. Like, what do you got to lose, Vlad? What like what's uh, like it? Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna trigger a few people with this uh, analogy, this comparison. So you know, just deep breath. It's kind of like how I feel about Vigano, like. Vigano keeps putting down cards. Like we're two, we're we're four or five years after the fact here, bro. I wanted to see your whole hand. Okay, you got something to say? You've been using the Vatican secret your whole career. Now all of a sudden you are lifting the veil and you're putting your cards down. I believe the cards you're putting down. 
but don't reserve any more. Don't keep a couple in your pocket. Don't do that. I don't like that. That's not right. Put them on the table, full transparency. If you, if I'm going to entrust you and we're going to trust each other, then I don't want to hear two years later, you still have a card in your pocket that you're ready to play. That is manipulative. And I don't like that. Put the card on the table, say, this is the deal. This is the truth. If I, my, my conscience is telling me to, to reveal the truth and I'm going to, I'm going to uh, violate the Vatican secret deal, then I'm putting my cards on the table. I've always felt that about Vigano. Uh, not that I didn't believe him. It's that I always felt like he was holding something back. That is a power player being manipulative. I don't like that, even if he is playing with truth. Vlad, same I, I thing. Agree. So similarly, like Putin, what do you got to lose, bro? You want us to believe you? But you're not going to you're not going to name names. You're not going to you're going to avoid uh, the the sticky points. You're not you're going to just dance around this with a history lesson and a a shuck and jive here and there. Like, bro, I can't trust you as far as I can throw you. And then especially on your faith, you go weak sauce on your faith. Like I wanted when it came to the faith, I wanted Tucker to go, uh, Mr. President, um, you, you sing the praises of the Russian Orthodox. Rightfully so. OK, great. Uh, but can you explain to me why abortion has been such a pandemic, such a plague on society of Russian women? Can you explain to me why uh, vodka is subsidized in your country and alcoholism is through the roof? Can I just, I just want to know how faith plays a role in those big moral issues in your country. Can you just explain that to me? And wh- why would you – if you're a Russian Orthodox, then why would you embrace you know, Muslim faith or whatever else because of political expediency. That seems contrary to what we believe. That seems strange to me. Can you, you know, like he didn't push back on any of those things. And he, um, you know, he certainly, uh, he certainly allowed Putin to go kind of very weak sauce on that. I, I was surprised. Like, why would Vlad not do that? Like, why wouldn't he come out? If he really believed these things, why wouldn't he, like, what is the political expediency to play, play the soft ground on that? I don't know. It was felt weird to me. I, I, it was it was I, I think there was probably a set time, by the way, Joe, and I think uh, Putin grandstand it probably. Two Tucker those, said no. Yeah. Tucker no, said there I know was he no did. time limit. I know there was that he said it, but that doesn't mean Putin didn't have a time limit. Basically, uh, I had read the previous guy who interviewed Putin from the West was in 2019. And uh, after an hour and a half, Putin just got up and walked out. There was no even <laughs> graceful ending to the to the interview. Uh, so, bah. you know, Putin, basically, uh, well, bye from Tombstone, by the way, great movie. <laughs> so, anyway, uh, um, I, don't know no, Jack, I don't know that Jack Burton would agree with that, by the way. Just saying. Tombstone? Mm hmm. I was literally oh, just watching a scene from it last night. I love that movie. Uh, oh, by the way, uh, not to interrupt your movie. thought, <laughs> but while I'm thinking yeah. about it, Jake, did you yeah. watch the Vlad, Vladimir Putin Tucker Carlson interview? No, I haven't watched it yet. I, saw, I would have I loved a to have gotten bit of it. your take on his comments on Poland. On it. You know, what did you think about that, Mike, about uh, what Vla- uh, Vlad said about <sighs> Poland and Russian history and, and all the he, rest? He's, well, you know, I, I was chuckling because I, I he's playing fast and loose with the facts. Stalin also had an agreement with Hitler and cooperated with Hitler until Hitler mm-hmm. turned on him. And, and yeah. uh, you, you know, go. and he's throwing the poles under the uh, <laughs> the bus, so to speak. Meanwhile, you know, uh, what is it? uh the, the scriptural saying splinter in your eye while you have the log in your own. Mm-hmm. I was kind of listening to that saying, what's going on here, uh, Vladdy? Yeah. You're, you're kind of uh, ignoring the fact that Stalin was cooperating with Hitler as well. Uh, and yeah, I, th- I found that fascinating as well. And, uh, you know, I'm not so sure that Russia was going to go fly in and, and, and save Czechoslovakia from <laughs> from Hitler when they had a treaty with Hitler at the time. And and so I, yeah. I, I disbelieve that. That was fiction. Uh, so did you get the sense, because we've been, this week we had, uh, was it this week or last week, we had Xavier uh, back on the program to talk about prophecy. He'll be back, by the way, uh, February the 26th. He's rebooked to be back on the show, I think. Um, but we've been talking a lot about prophecy. Uh, man, I'm thinking about recording uh, the I think I might I might record a video for the insiders on reading Anne Catherine Emmerich's prophecies in this. It's really really good, and I want to share that with you. So I may be doing that soon. So be on the email list. But um, so we've been talking about the prophecies of the army from the east invading Europe, mm. and then obviously the rise of the the French monarch who listens to this show. Just saying, just saying. Um. <laughs> Did you get the sense from Vladimir Putin 
that he has any intentions for further expansion beyond what he considers territorial lands uh, that are historically Russian? I don't. I didn't get that sense. I know that Colonel the Colonel yesterday would disagree with me, but I, I think uh, I think he wants what he believes is historically Russian. Uh, which think about that 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 in and of itself is is scary enough. Imagine if you had an Austrian leader who wanted everything that was historically Austria. We're talking half of Europe, there, folks. Half of Europe would be Austrian. <laughs> I know a guy from Austria <laughs> happens to go by Habsburg. I am trying to encourage him to take to, to get the band back together, but uh, he's he's a good young man too, isn't he? He is. Yeah. <laughs> so he's a uh, and his book is really great. If you haven't read it, folks, uh, please check it out. Uh, the Habsburg Way, isn't that what it's called? The Habsburg Way. Yeah. Um, yeah I met him when I was in when I was in Rome. I got to hang out with him for a few minutes. It was great. Yeah, I mean, but my point being, if you use those historical precedences like Putin does, mm. you can take all kinds of land away and never be outside your historical Russian grounds or your historical Austrian yeah. grounds. Yeah. Uh, and, and so uh, does that then thereby give the Austrians uh, the power to invade France? Because most yeah, of France I mean, this is, is a principle. This Empire. is a principle I always think of with the Palestinian Israeli thing. Now, uh, no matter how you feel about uh, about Israel and their tactics or whatever, and I have been critical of their t their tactics. I have a, an old article of them uh, discussing how they use pornography as a weapon against the Palestinians. They invaded mm -hmm. uh, and then they took over the television stations and pumped out porn twenty four seven to keep the young men at home. Right, so let that sink in. That's diabolic. That's not right. You don't do those kinds of yeah. things. Um, uh, so I, I've been very critical. I'm not uh, not 100 percent in that camp, but I'm also definitely not a team terrorist. Forget that. Uh, I'm not going to do it. But um, the argument that, well, the Palestinians were already there when, in the 40s. The, uh, the UK gave them the land back. Well, um, I don't I think that's debatable for starters. I don't believe that they were there. I think they got pumped in as a result to trying to push back against the Jews coming into the Holy Land again. And I don't think it's I, th I don't think it's disputable. I think it clearly archaeologically the Jews obviously that was their land. I mean, and before them it was the Canaanites, and before them it you know. So my point is like to your point, like if this was the principle, but this land once belonged to us, then you could apply that all kinds of places, right? Uh, Texas should belong to Mexico, but then Texas should belong to the Aztecs, but then Texas should belong to the Indians that the Aztecs kicked out. Because there was a there were a people before them. Did you know that there were? Of course there was. So, I mean, uh, in fact, you know, uh, as the as the native populations in in just in North America alone, the, as they moved, they were kicking out other native populations. They were taking new hunting lands. They were happy to go to war with their neighbor to get what they wanted. Um, so, as the colonials did it to the natives, the natives had already been doing it to other natives. So there's just never going to be an example where you're going to find a people that was always in this land and it always belonged to them. And then they were unduly, unfairly treated by other people. Yes, they were unjustly treated by other people, but they only were doing it to others themselves. So this is the guess that the, the, the bottom line here, the historical argument doesn't really work in this case, nor does it, I think, necessarily work for the for the Israelis being given the land back by, by the UK. Do I feel like they should have a place to go uh, and live in peace and safety? Yes, 100% I do. And yes, I recognize that the uh, from an archaeological historical perspective that that land was theirs. But I also believe that that land, uh, that the new Israel is is the church and, uh, and the church is, uh, Israel is perfected in Christ. And I believe that the church should still rule under a monarch in Israel. And I do believe the Jews should live there in peace. And they should be evangelized as well. That's what I believe. Because, uh, you know, at the end of the day, and by the way, we should all be guard our hearts carefully against anti anti-Semitism. Because the day will come that if we get to make it to heaven through the grace of God and perseverance on our part, we will be side by side in the beatific vision with those Jews who do convert in the end. Uh, we need, by to, the way, we'll, we need we'll... to prepare a place in our heart for that day. <laughs> right, And we'll be judged by a Jewish carpenter. So yeah, be yeah for and that. and I and I love a Jewish woman. I'm going to be honest with you. Uh, madly in love with with our lady, a Jewish woman, and uh, of course the apostles, all being Jews. So yes. um, you know, it, we need to prepare a place in our heart 
for those brothers and sisters who will spend eternity with us in the beatific vision. And if there's a hardness of heart towards these people now because of their hardness of heart, then we are missing, we are missing the, we are the plot point here. Uh, we need to evangelize all and not some. And the ultimate destiny of where we are going is that beatific vision. So let's prepare ourselves for that day. And we need to act like it, right? So I just wanted to make that point. You were saying? Let's talk, before you throw me off the air, before Jake throws us off, because I guess he has a hot date or something here in a little while. Uh, Yes. I control everything. Did you, did you want to talk at all about what we saw on the border in that, that. Yes, I do. So don't throw us off, Jake, because I I do, I do want to talk about. Well, we're already past the time when I would have. (laughs) I already made the command decision to let you guys keep on. See how, (laughs) how, see how Jake is totally in charge of everything. Can I, can I just. Yep. Let me just show you this real quick. So this is a story I wanted to cover as well. I don't know if you guys saw this, but James O'Keefe going, but James O'Keefe is really reverting back all of a sudden, reverting back to his, his early days. This is how James oh, yeah. started. James going into disguise, doing the undercover thing. Remember when he did the whole prostitute going in, a pimp thing going into Planned Parenthood, and they did the whole whatever. It's like, this is like, James has gone back to basics here. So he's got this new video he's posted about out in Tucson, Arizona, where it is highly guarded. It's an entire hotel that's become an immigrant, migrant, illegal migrant uh, facility. It's guarded by police. It's guarded by uh, Customs and Border Protection. And the sheriff's office is even involved. And James tried to go figure out what was going down there. And they were like preventing him from coming onto the property. He he disguised himself as a like a drunken vagrant or something. And then he he, he was able to get some whistleblowers to take cameras on the inside. So what did they learn? The the, the whole place is filled with illegal migrants. They learned That's that it. they learned that uh, they are that they that the authorities know that these migrants are trained and taught what to say and how to say it, what to avoid saying, and to lie about their status and and whatever. That they have military-aged males filling this place up, not women and children. That uh, that there are gang members with prison gang tattoos coming through this place, busloads of illegals coming through this place, and they are being protected and guarded by the uh, by the authorities. And you are not allowed to know about what the real deal is there. And here's the real kicker: it's being underwritten and funded by Catholic Community Services. How do we feel about that, Mike? I was hurt. I, I truly was. In fact, my immediate response was, uh, I think I shot back to you in a text, this is disturbing. Um, it, it, it's vile and disgusting. First of all, I know it's going to be tough getting an airline flight there because Alexandria or Ortez, whatever her name is, AOC, I'm sure, has booked all the flights down there to go demonstrate against the uh, Biden administration for the way our illegal uh, folks are being treated, right? You saw the picture of that ballroom. And I was like, what a cesspool they're putting these poor people in. This is disgusting right, that's and the vile. Other yeah. And, and so, and to, and to do it in the name of our holy church, uh, shame on them. I'm sorry, shame on yeah. them. Yeah. If, if you don't have the money to house that many people, then reduce the number of people you house and, and give them some kind of dignity. And I would allow agree. Them to be there. Yeah. Uh, Setting aside the gangbangers and whoever else is there who shouldn't be there, but there were also families there, and you see them in that video clip that O'Keefe shared, and I found that incredibly disturbing and and sad. And and like I said, where are all the folks that went and protested Trump's cages, which by the way existed since the the Clinton administration? Oh man, yeah, yeah. I mean, they've been around forever. I mean, good grief, this is not new. Hey, by the way, Carrie, Karen, Andy, Bashaw. I agree with you. I, I'm not. I, I'm not a James O'Keefe fanboy. I'm not. Me either, I mean, me I, I appreciate the the. Uh, I appreciate uh, sort of shining the light into dark spaces aspect of what he does. But as far as him personally, this is a guy who purports to be Catholic but doesn't live like one. So you know, I'm not. Uh, I'm not singing his praises personally. But I do. I do believe that this. Uh, this. These stories need to be outed. You know, as a Catholic. My heart sympathizes with those who want a better life in this country. Amen. You know, a better life anywhere. I feel like they're being manipulated. I feel like they're being used from a, for a greater agenda, and they're being a, they're like a pawn in someone else's game for the most part. But I also believe that there are a lot of bad actors in this. Um, not, either way, as a Catholic, if our neighbor needs something, 
our Lord made it clear that we're, we're to help. We're to be the help for them. So I don't fault Catholic organizations helping migrants. I don't like, there's a, there's a, there's a clinic here run by Catholic organization that, that helps anybody who needs help, whether or not they have immigration status or not. They need medical attention. They get it there. Praise be to God. That should be our, that should be uh, our position. We help people. If they need medical attention, we should give it to them. If they need food, we should, we should feed them. If they need clothing, we should give it to them, et cetera, et cetera. That's what we're called to do. I believe our borders should be secure. I believe that we should have legal immigration, not illegal immigration. I believe it should be fair and responsible and not a manipulation of any political party whatsoever. And I definitely think we ought to push back against the world, uh, world agenda power elites that are using this for their, for their end goal. I, I definitely believe that. But at the same time, like this, it's clear to me that going through this kind of reporting, we're discovering that what's the real deal here? It's a money game. They're getting paid. It is payday. It is guaranteed payday. It is government funds for every immigrant that they help. They're getting paid. They're happy to go through all of this oh, yeah. to keep the money train going. And this, this is, is where I say, it is the Catholic Church who, who, uh, who gave us the soup kitchen. It is the Catholic Church who gives us the universities. It is the Catholic Church that gives us hospitals. Get out of our way. Let us do what is our mission to do, what, what God gave us the mission to do, to evangelize the world first and to care through corporate works of mercy for, the, uh, for others second. When the bubonic plague hit, doctors left town, Catholic priests stayed. Right? Yep. That's the deal. So, um, but we ought not to be taking government funds. And I think immediately the USCCB should cease taking all government funds, 100%, cut it all off, get rid of this milk cow, and stand alone on your own two feet and the God-given mission that, that Jesus Christ handed to you, to you through the apostles down through the ages. Like, it's got to stop, but that's the problem. That's the problem I have with all we, of this. We, we can't, we can't, or I can't argue with that, Joe. You're absolutely right. And by the way, this goes back to the Boris Johnson question too, by the way. It's always follow the money trail. Follow the money trail on these issues. Why did Boris Johnson kibosh the peace deal with Putin? $72 billion with a B dollars of aid that's gone to Ukraine. Who benefits yeah. from that? Yeah, Who benefits the emergency from that? funding bill. <laughs> The emer- yes. we, they put together an emergency funding bill, not for the border security issue, but for Ukraine. Like, By the way, funded, funded at a level higher than the Coast Guard and the Marine Corps' total budgets combined. Which is, and uh, how, what, how many 50, Republicans 50, were, on, were on Team Ukraine, Team Give Money to Ukraine, but yeah. not to the border? Yeah, no, I'm sorry. I, I, you, you, gotta, you all have to lose your jobs. I just... No, I'm done. I'm the, done. The shocker to me was Tom McClintock, who who used to be a really good conservative, and he's obviously flipped as well. So I, I, I am I, and I'm not trying to divert us away from this border discussion because what I watched was disturbing. And like I said, I know all the Democrats are getting ready to go down there and protest, which is probably why you can't get a flight there. Uh, but that that's this was serious. These are both very seriously disturbing. And but no lover of James O'Keefe either. Uh, but he does he does shine the flashlight yeah. in dark spaces yeah. that it's not supposed to go, doesn't he? Yeah. And 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 I I people deserve to be treated with dignity. Obviously, uh, at least, yeah. that's what our church teaches us, right? That's right. what the, exactly, that's what our yeah. our Savior taught us. Which is so. why it's it's hard for us to as Catholics because clearly the Republicans, the so called conservatives. They have a very worldly point of view. I, I'm sorry, I don't share that. <clears throat> I'm Catholic. I look at the whole world and every single issue through the Catholic lens. That's why it's my Catholic. It's a Catholic take, right? So it's a Catholic take on everything, literally everything, because there's only one body, Christ's body. He only has one body. That body is equal to the church. And so the church can only be one. It can't be a multiplicity. It can't be thousands of versions of it. It can't be your flavor, my flavor. There's only one flavor, and that's the only flavor I want, and that's the Lord and Savior Christ Jesus. Whatever he wanted, whatever he intends, that's what we should want. The end of subject, right? <clears throat> so Agreed. Agreed. the Republicans, the so-called conservatives, and even the libertarians, they only take us so far, Right. So we put all our baskets, Joe, we got to, you got to be on the team or, or, or else the other side wins. Are you kidding me? How many Republicans have been in office or Congress, been in charge of Congress and nothing has changed? 
We still spend way above. <clears throat> Just ask Vladimir Putin. He reminded us last night that we are spending way more than we need to be spending right now. So not only is China bigger, has a better economy, according to Vladimir Putin, but we have massive border problems and an economic disaster. And there you go. So Republican, Democrat, what's changed? Foreign policy, what's changed? Nothing, nothing. Border security, what's changed? Nothing. So here we go. You're putting all your eggs in that that evangelical, that worldview, uh, that er earthly, here and now worldview conservatism. You're going to be disappointed every time. Oh, oh, it's it's Woods rule number one. No matter who you elect, you get John McCain's foreign policy. That's rule Bingo. Woods rule number one. And you're yeah. always going to get. It doesn't matter if it's Obama or Trump, sadly, or whomever. Yeah. You're going to get. You're going to get that that policy. And uh, by the way, if you don't think there are bigger powers in in play here, Trump. I believe Trump said, thought he everything he said in 2016 before he got elected, and what happened once he got the office. What happened? Well, he got shown like, OK, so like Tucker, he got he got he got schooled. He got schooled by the bureaucracy. He got schooled by the, the deep state. He got yep. shown that you can't be you, you're going to walk in here thinking you're the art of the deal guy. Oh, yeah. Well, hold my beer. Watch this. And <laughs> um, and so maybe he's a little wiser now, but he's also a lot, a lot more compromising now. Yeah. So his, his, his compromise on abortion is disturbing to me. You know, it is. We've talked about this. But, yeah, I, I I'm 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 struggling a bit with. Joe, I'm, I'm just thinking aloud here, and, and, and pardon me if I mess this up, but imagine if our bishops turned away the money of the government and said the second collection in every Catholic church every single Sunday goes towards ensuring the dignity of human beings and, and opening soup kitchens and making the adoption process less of a convoluted, crazy affair, which Catholic Charities, by the way, is supposed to be doing. And, 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 and if they went ahead and took care of these moms and said, hey, have your baby. We're going to take care of everything. We're going to go ahead and make sure there's a good adoption fa adopt a family out there who's been begging for a child. And, and sorry, it's hitting me in the heart to even say this. Yeah. It's been begging for a child for years and is willing to go through every hoop to get that kid. Imagine the power our church would have in this society. Exactly. Yeah, and amen. Exactly. 100%. Sorry, sorry I'm losing right it. On, bro. That, that, was, no, it's, that was too close it's true, to heart. Though. People ask, people ask Joe, what you, you're so critical, Joe. You know, what do you want them to do? Stop playing games and start getting serious? Cut off government teat? And just be Catholic, be boldly Catholic, be courageously Catholic. Pretend for just one second that you actually believe the words of Jesus when he said, go and make disciples of all nations. Pretend as though that you believe that and that becomes your mission and then go and act accordingly. Like, that's it. Like, if you just like, you don't have to be, you don't got to be like a, a, an Athanasius knight or to be inspiring. You could just. Take your job seriously to evangelize every soul, not some souls. Stop trying to play nice with, with Caesar and just actually be boldly, courageously Catholic. Let the chips fall where they may. No thanks. We don't need your government money. That's okay. Hey, listen, we're going to go alone. We're going to build hospitals without you. Did Padre Pio need government money to build a hospital? No. no. Which, by no. the way, so to rabbit hole, it is, in my defense, it is on on the list of sounds and it's Friday of the show. and it's Friday rabbit hole. So I just finished the book on Rudolph diesel that you, oh. that you, uh, <laughs> that you manipulated me into, into going through. Oh yeah. Yeah. yeah that's me. <laughs> so we're talking about the manipulations of Vlad Vladimir Putin, but let's talk about the manipulations of Mike Koeniger. He, uh, he gets me to go through this book on, on Rudolph diesel, the man who invented the diesel engine, which starts off with the man's death. Did he commit mm -hmm. suicide? Was he murdered by the, the, the Rockefellers? <sighs> or the Kaiser. Or the Kaiser. Or the Kaiser. So, uh, 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 Padre Pio. Padre Pio was gifted the, was gifted the, um, uh, the patent. I think it was the patent. Or the license. It was, maybe there's a license. It was the license for the, the diesel locomotive. Right, 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 right. And, um. And he had a guy go and travel all across Europe selling access to this license to the diesel locomotive. And all that money went to go build the uh, went to go build a hospital there in Petrolachina. So San Giovanni uh, there. 
an amazing hospital, state of the art, best of the best. Never took government money for it, but he did take diesel money for it. And Diesel, by the way, it's an incredible book. It was a great, great story. I, I don't want to enjoy it. I don't. I don't want to spoil it for you. But the man who never was. That's all I'm saying. You the know, man the man who never the, was. But you can't sad... find that movie now. I need to go watch that movie, The Man Who Never Was. I can't find it. I can't find it. Here, here's anywhere. the sad part of that book, and I don't know if you caught it, but I did. And 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 please chime in. You have this Bavarian Catholic who essentially turned his back on his historical faith in Rodolf Diesel. And that was the part that I wished I had read more about in the book. Uh, how, how, does, how did they end up going to Lutheran churches in Paris, number one? They're from Bavaria, which is very Catholic. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and number two, how does he end up writing that, that worldly New Age tome that he wrote in the middle of all his successes that nobody bought? Well, money. And, and, yeah. Money, money will do that to you. He became very powerful, very, very wealthy. The diesel engine revolutionized the industrial revolution. So, without the diesel engine, could we say we are where we are today? No, Probably not. No, we couldn't. We couldn't. Uh, the and, diesel and engine it, his was success, a game changer. His success hit him when he was Jake's age. He I mean, had invented the engine when he was Jake's age. Isn't that amazing? So it's not. Too I mean, late like for me. you can't get to a Cummins engine, okay? In a Ford F three fifty diesel four by four, unless you have Rudolph Diesel. I mean, that's how baller well, well, that man was. Uh, all right, all right, Joe, we got to fix you here. Cummins would be Dodge. <laughs> oh, okay, what, what's what's the diesel in the in the in the Ford then? I'm I don't know. I have a Dodge. That, <laughs> so. I, think the, I think the I think the Ford is the uh, Ford is the Power Stroke. What's right? the, is it the Power yeah, Stroke? I forget. I don't know. Well, I don't, I don't own a diesel. I've never owned a diesel. I wouldn't know. Oh, Detroit yeah. Diesel is Chevrolet. It was made by GMC. So okay. I, I, okay. I, I, I don't remember all these things either. But yeah, it's, it's. Uh, but I knew you'd love that book. Uh, I don't know that I was manipulative to get you to read. Uh, it was great, though. I enjoyed it. It was really. I don't good. think you have to manipulate yeah. anything to get Joe to read a book. I think Joe uh, about history, a book. especially <laughs> one that's about history. <laughs> And speaking one of, that's not speaking boring of history, either. I did want to comment on something because, Joe, you actually tied into something I wanted to say about the Tucker interview when you started talking about conservatives, which is – now, I haven't seen it yet, but mm. what, what it strikes me – because I've, I've already seen memes going around about like, oh, uh, I'm, uh, I'm going – Tucker, I'm going to tell you about how the Civil War started. And Tucker's like, oh, so like Missouri Compromise and stuff and, and, uh, and, and Putin goes – it's in the – someone shared uh, – I think Rudy shared it in the, um, in the insider group. Uh, and and Putin responds, no, I, I, we have to start with when the when the Anglo Anglo Saxons arrived. And like he goes back all the way. That is how that is how the old wor- world thinks, and that's especially how the East thinks. Yes. And us Westerners, and especially us Americans, cannot comprehend it because we we're teenagers on the world stage. Like for oh, yeah. for us for us, trad means the 1950s. <laughs> like and conservative yes. means like yeah. the liberals of the 1700s and 1800s. Yeah. Con- like for that's our our worldview is a couple hundred years old and that's all we can conceive of. And when you're so when you're dealing with the old world and especially the east, you have to really like forget your way of thinking about things and it's like, "Oh, to go back like, oh, this all goes back to to these things got bad under Obama or or these things got bad under Clinton." Or these things got bad under maybe Jimmy Carter or whatever. Like, no. Like, these, these things go back a long time. And to get to causes, like, it's, things weren't, like, fine and dandy. Like, because we had some periods of economic success in America when mm-hmm. under supposedly, like, conservative, like, old-fashioned American ideals, like, we think that that's the good old days that we have to get back to. You know? Yeah. So, and things got bad once, you know, insert thing from the 20th century came around. Yeah, exactly. And that's not how that works. And, and that's where... Maybe maybe that I would love if that kind of, you know, oh, you have to go back that far to understand where this is coming from. Like, I would love well, get, if oh, more people okay. like, you know, you start pulling <laughs> on that great. thread, though, Jake, you're going to end up in Genesis chapter three. Of course. But like that's, <laughs> well, that's <laughs> where you have to go back to. You have to go back to. <laughs> you know, I mean, exactly. <laughs> OK, so uh, t- to put a fine point on that, you're going to have to go back 6000 years. Sure. Exactly. Give it, or take. It, did you catch I, 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 I think it's eight thousand now. Right? We're in we're in twenty we're, we're, we're in twenty we're, we're in twenty uh, twenty four now. So I think it's eight thousand. Young Earth so, creation. It's eight. Not I'm going to share something though that someone told me once. I was having a discussion with a Marianite Arab, 
uh, at a restaurant that his family ran. That we sounds like a joke set up. What's the, what's the, a Coast Guard, a Maronite Arab, a and, a, <laughs> <laughs> and, a, and a rabbi, by the and way, which was in, which was in, which was in Ghent in Norfolk, which is a, a Jewish neighborhood. Oh, there you but, go. No, I was in this restaurant and he and I started talking politics a little bit to a degree. And of course, Maronites are Catholics, by the way. Uh, yes. There, yes. there are Eastern, Eastern it's, oh, Catholic brothers. It's funny you bring it up. It's his feast day today, St. John Maron. There you go. So, the, and this guy and I are talking about Middle Eastern policy, which you know is an obsession for me, and and, and we're talking about the plight of Christians in, in Israel, uh, and this would have been four or five years ago, and he said, you know, the serious issue I see is that uh, we in the Middle East think that in millennia. We, we have a millennial perspective to everything that goes on, mm-hmm. which is what you saw in Putin last night, by the way. Mm-hmm. And yes. you Americans, and when he said it, I went, oh, he's so right. You think in election <laughs> cycles. You yes, think in right. election yes, cycles. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And when he said so it, I went, spot on. oh. <laughs> so spot on. Yeah. Yay and amen. Praise <laughs> be to God. Hey, by the way, uh, Christine Dion, uh, which is uh, – which is C- Colored Pencils 101. Mm-hmm. Hey, I am not from New Hampshire. I lived there 10 years. When I got out of the Marine Corps in 95, I went to broadcasting school in Oklahoma. And then when I graduated Oklahoma, uh, the broadcasting school, I sold my car and all my possessions, bought a one-way train ticket to Boston Garden Station, and uh, stepped off the platform April 1st, 1997, and spent 10 years there uh, where I met my wife, where I became Catholic, started a family, and then we moved the family down to – I actually grew up in San Antonio, but I was born in Missouri. That helps. So, But uh, Manch Vegas – oh, yeah. In fact, we were there. We were there. <laughs> it's been over a year now. It's been it's been just over a year since we went back to New Hampshire. Uh, got to hook year? up with was, Mike yeah. there. It was 2022, yep. right? Was it 2022? Yeah, October? it was October 20, October 2022. Yep. And yep. Uh, we took, we, my wife and I took our kids down memory lane for us. And so we drove them through all of the cool spots that when, when we were courting, we would hang out there in, uh, in Manchester. So we, into the, the, the Bass Island Estates over on the west side of the Miramac. That's where my, my wife was living when I first met her. And then just around the corner was the apartment that I got so I could be close to her. You know, so, uh, you know, we were taking them to the, the cathedral and all the cool uh, old haunts that her and I used to have while we were there. Uh, so that was a lot of fun. And um, in, New Hampshire is such a beautiful state. I would live there if it wasn't surrounded and run by crazy people. Honestly, it's such a beautiful place to be. But uh, hopefully we'll get back there soon. In fact, we're, we're, we're trying to angle some way to get back there this year sometime. We'll see how it goes. It, it By the way, I see— It is an island of sanity. It is an island of sanity in New sanity, England. Sanity, use that sanity in loose terms. But, uh, well, KSW, in, comparative to, in comparative terms. Well, that's like <laughs> saying Trump is better than the alternative. Duh, my dog is better than the alternative. I mean, like, this is not even an argument. Like, what are we talking yeah, about? Your dog's I'm, not an option. I'm just saying, I'm, I'm wondering what all those people My dog like... identifies as a political candidate, Mike. Stop. <laughs> Stop being so insensitive. I, I assumed dog. your dog's pronouns. It's I'm the, sorry. The bark party versus the wolf party. That's right. Where, uh, I wonder how all those people who moved to Montana are feeling mm-hmm. right now. Like, oh, we'll be fine. We're going to move to Montana. We're going to move to a good conservative state. I wonder how they're feeling. Just That's right. And if Just you enjoy, enjoy your liberalness. Yeah. Uh, KSW says, I saw an old video. Uh, wow, you lost a lot of weight. I have. Uh, about 150 pounds. Do I feel great? That's a subjective question. Uh, hmm. So yes, in many ways, I would say, yes, I feel great. I think I think clearer. But that's just because I don't eat carbs as much, right? Like I have a, a, far, a, a drastic a fewer carbs than before and carbs cause fog brain sugar is sugar is the enemy so uh cutting those things out help with that but in some other ways it things have gotten a lot better but there's other there's newer issues let's just say like my shoulder for instance is being a a major issue some of that could be because because of muscle deterioration in my shoulder but I, um, I think it's because all the inflammation that you had in your body's gone away, and now you can focus on the things that truly hurt because you messed them maybe. up. And I'm, maybe. And I'm not being funny. I'm not maybe. being funny. So, but my know, posture's when was the last gotten time worse. You had gout because of oh well. I probably will always have gout, but it, I don't feel the effects of it because of the lack of inflammation. Right. There so, you, go. you know, and it's fascinating. Uh, we love history, so we read a, read a lot about history stuff. You go back. Uh, D- Rudolf Diesel had gout. Yeah. Right. How many yeah. uh, you go through, you look at go, go read 1776 and, and uh, 
how many of the colonial uh, leaders, English generals, American revolutionary generals, all had gout, had to be carried into battle. Ben Franklin yep. had gout, had to be carried around, you know. Man, Rich inflammation. Disease, they would call it. By, like, by the way, I, that was. before we part ways, I, I've got to talk about the manipulation of one Joe McClain. So, what? You, what? So I, Stop. Uh, so it's good to talk yeah, to you guys. Listen, hey, listen. have a great day, uh, Jake. Uh, <laughs> well, let's, sorry, Jake's let's kicking us off Jake, Jake, leave me on the air. Leave me on the air, Jake. Because Too bad I we have, ran out of time. I have six books written by a guy named Warren Carroll because some knucklehead <laughs> told me he was the greatest historian <laughs> who ever lived. Uh, he, well, he is. And, and of course, they're not in print. So, so you're, truth. You're, you're scouring the used book market to find these books. And, and But by the way, they were like 10, 12 bucks each. They weren't that yeah. awfully expensive. But he is absolutely wonderful. The problem is everything's 9,000 pages long and there's six of them. And so in the time I would normally normally read four books i read one <laughs> so, but, i love but warren he, carroll though it's so good and, and you know this is so the good. this is the book joe wanted to charge everybody what was it you were asking for ten thousand dollars ten thousand yeah. my, my daughter has stolen it from me for free just so you know and, and but, uh, look at the size of his ten thousand dollar book folks what did you it, pay for that <laughs> Uh, what was this your cost? was 119 pages, including the end notes. I think it was 20 or 30 bucks. It wasn't terrible. 30 bucks for 119 pages. <laughs> well, when wow. I bought it, I didn't know it was 119 pages. Although <laughs> I paid 50 bucks for this guy, and it's equally small. It's tiny, but it's got really <laughs> small print, so it takes a lot longer to read. So, uh, yeah, 50 well, bucks but, for that. Was it worth it? Um, I'm going to we'll say see. probably not. I would have paid. I think this one. I, I, I would have paid one twenty, is, no problem for it. But this one, this one is worth it. This one's worth yeah, it. Yeah. And then it. I, so I go to the ICC, which you also manipulated me into, by the way, the Institute of Catholic Culture. I can't be to yeah. blame for your troubles. <laughs> Stop so it. I go. ICC I go is great. to their. I go to their 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 kickoff meeting for new new newcomers, and they're they're talking, and I didn't realize it was all Christendom College. I had yes, no it clue. Is. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> you need to go back, go back and look for the old Marshner uh, lectures. Oh, Marshner. Joe, he, Joe, you're manipulating me again. You need to stop. Jake, make him stop. <laughs> that guy, <laughs> Joe, stop. That guy is like, Mar Marshner is like crack for 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 Hunter Biden. It's like it's like a moth to light. You know, you just once you have some some Marshner lecture you got to have more of it that's the problem his, oh, and, his, and... his use of, of his skillful use of snark oh it's so good my, my last pithy so comment of the week because i only get to have three uh my last pithy comment of the week to the those folks who are leaving our our blessed mother church to become lutherans you never go to a church where when they didn't like the book in the bible they got rid of it i'm just saying you yeah. don't do it. And, and yeah. if he had had his way, they'd be eight less, not seven less, because he wanted to get rid of the epistle of James as well. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. you don't leave Holy Mother Church for people who eliminate the books that they find problematic. Yeah, it, it's, <laughs> so, it's less than optimal, as we would say, less than optimal. Yeah, yeah. All right. I, I'm, uh, that's it. I'm out of pithy comments. You might as well put good us news, off the air now. <laughs> good news, bad news. Uh, the good what? news is we're, we're, we're out of time. Um, so you, you can stop manipulating us now, Mike, but the bad news is the bad news is, uh, Monday, I have no idea who's going to be on the show. So guess what the rest of my day is going to look like uh, booking guests for next week. So that's a good time. Praise be to God. So let's pray that we get some great guests on the hook and some great conversations on the hook. Do us a favor, you know, share this content, like this content, subscribe if you can, wherever you're watching, it really helps us. The like button is a powerful algorithm pusher. Even if you don't love every subject we talk about or every conversation we have, simply hitting that like is a great way to share us with strangers. So be on the team. Five-star reviews on the podcast is also a great way to increase our awareness uh, on yep. platforms like Spotify or, or the iTunes Store. These are fantastic ways to support our cause, and we would be grateful for it. God love you. God bless you. Thank you all for hanging out and having a good time today and participating in the poll. We'll see you on Monday.